Greetings, everyone, and thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is David Smith, and I'll be the moderator for today's presentation, incorporating laser therapy into clinical practice. The objectives of today's webinar will be to learn more about the fundamentals of low-level laser therapy and its clinical effectiveness, to assess whether you should be incorporating low-level laser therapy into your practice, to hear from a panel of direct practitioners to get their insight into the success of implementing low-level laser therapy into the practice, and to learn about the potential impact that laser therapy can have on your clinic revenue. We are pleased to have a number of very experienced practitioners today who are all very experienced in the application of laser phototherapy within their practice. I'd like to take a moment to introduce each of them to you. Cheryl Russell is a leader in medical massage therapy and cold laser therapy for acute and chronic injuries. Cheryl owns and operates the CLR Cold Laser Relief Clinic in Great Neck, New York, specializing in soft tissue injuries and acute and chronic pain. Cheryl has been a professional member of the American Massage Therapy Association since 1995 and is a member of the North American Laser Therapy Association, as well as the World Association of Laser Therapy. Cheryl has designed a unique method of working with soft tissue, combining medical massage therapy along with cold laser therapy, making her a leader in soft tissue repair. Dr. David Homer is the founder and professional staff member of the Yorkville Chiropractic and Wellness Center, located in the heart of downtown Toronto, Ontario, Canada. The center provides professional chiropractic care, massage therapy, custom orthotics, laser therapy, active release technique, and other health and wellness services to families, business professionals, athletes, and more. What separates them from other wellness centers in, in Toronto is Dr. Homer's focus on educating patients so that they can not only get immediate pain relief, but also balance their lives to achieve better long-term health. Dr. William Stephen is a graduate of University of Buffalo SUNY School of Medicine. Dr. Stephen's family medicine residency was completed at Southside Hospital in Bayshore, New York, where he served as co-chief resident. Over the past 25 years, Dr. Stephen has practiced family medicine, the last 18 years of which he has practiced in the Buffalo area. Dr. Stephen's office is located in Tonawanda, New York, and as a member of the Envision Health primary care team, Dr. Stephen is trained to assist patients of all ages. His patient-centric approach focuses on health and wellness education, disease prevention, and the treatment of acute and chronic illness and injury. Dr. Elizabeth Angelewski graduated from McMaster University with a Bachelor of Science in Kinesiology and a Doctor of Chiropractic degree from the Canadian Memorial Chiropractic College. Dr. Angelewski is a trained acupuncturist from the Contemporary Medical Acupuncture Program and has completed postgraduate training in customer orthotic therapy. Dr. Angelewski is currently the Director of Clinical Education and Training at Theralase Technologies and runs a successful multi-room clinic at the Pain Therapy Clinic in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. She has a keen professional interest in helping patients achieve optimal health and well-being through the use of laser therapy. She's dedicated to improving their quality of life through laser treatment programs that are specifically designed for each patient. So now looking at today's agenda, <clears throat> we'll be dividing it into three segments of educational content. The first segment called the why will be about 30 minutes in length focusing on the efficacy of low-level laser therapy, the use of it to treat a variety of clinical conditions, and the benefits of laser therapy, looking at the top re five reasons why it's become more um, pervasive in practice. And that'll be uh, presented by Dr. Angelesky. Uh, the second module will be the how, again, approximately 30 minutes where our panel of speakers will be discussing their experiences on successfully integrating laser therapy into clinical practice. And finally, you'll have an opportunity, not only at the end, but throughout the presentation, to send 
questions uh, to the panelists uh, for their response. And uh, we encourage you to, to do that uh, throughout. Just a little bit of a company introduction. Theralace Technologies is headquartered in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And it's focused on the design, development, manufacturing, and marketing of its patented SuperPulse laser technology platform that is used in a wide range of biostimulative and biodestructive clinical applications in humans as well as in animals. Theralace operates under two divisions. The Therapeutic Laser Technology Division, which focuses on the development and commercialization of laser-based non-invasive pain management devices. And the Photodynamic Therapy Division, focused on the discovery of small light-activated molecules and the laser systems that activate them with high anti-cancer effectiveness, microbial sterilization potency, and bacterial infection control. Theralase is a world leader in the development of innovative medical-grade laser devices. Our systems are developed in partnership with world-renowned academic and medical research organizations to ensure maxim maximal clinical efficacy with each product and are used globally by practitioners representing a wide range of healthcare professions, in addition to a large number of professional sport teams that you may be familiar with. So now let's turn our attention to the webinar topic, incorporating laser therapy into clinical practice. Before we do, I, I do want to make sure that you adjust your screen to full screen. And to be able to do that, just take a look at the box in the corner there and, and click on full screen. And again, if you have questions, a reminder, just to use the question box, type your question in. We have a, a team of individuals that will be collating the questions that we'll deal with toward the end of the, um, the webinar. Okay, thank you, David, and uh, welcome to all of our attendees today. Uh, we just want to start with uh, giving you a brief overview of the science and the benefits of laser therapy and really try to understand why you would incorporate laser therapy into clinical practice. Now, low-level laser therapy is supported by randomized controlled clinical trials. There's over 3,000 of these studies worldwide, and about 300 of them are double-blind randomized controlled trials, and the strength of the evidence is actually ranked as strong for all the conditions that you see here on your screen. So it's a number of different neuromusculoskeletal conditions, anywhere ranging from tendinopathies to myofascial trigger point pain, rheumatoid arthritis, or even osteoarthritis, neck pain, lower back pain. So the evidence from these clinical studies is very strong in the uh, clinical effectiveness and the treatment of low-level laser therapy. Uh, the strength of evidence behind the use is found to be, to be strong overall, and its therapeutic effectiveness is substantiated. Now, when we look at laser therapy compared to some of the common modalities that we, we may use in our own clinics, for example, TENS, ultrasound, shockwave, and IFC, there are different mechanisms of action, and there are different contraindications and uh, risks, side effects that are associated with certain modalities. Now, the current treatment for MSK pain um, includes these modalities, and you know you can see you can see that they have more contraindications associated with them than laser therapy does. But if we let's start with the uh, the top there, the mechanisms of action. You can see that laser therapy it works on a on a cellular cellular level, and it it increases the production of ATP. It inhibits pain, releases endorphins, and we're going to get into a little bit more detail about how laser ther therapy actually works. But you can see a comparison of, of the different types of modalities and the, um, the mechanisms, of that, mechanisms of action that they work on, which is significantly fewer than laser therapy. Now, in terms of contraindications, laser therapy is known to be a very safe, uh, pain-free, non-invasive modality with very few contraindications. The, uh, the, the ones that you should be concerned about are uh, treating patients who have cancer, whether it's benign or malignant. We typically do recommend that they're about five years cancer free and then directly over the uterus in a pregnant woman. Uh, it's completely safe to use laser therapy in individuals with pacemakers or any metal implants. However, with the other electrical modalities such as TENS and IFC, even ultrasound, you're unable to use it for an individual's with these, these uh, conditions or these uh, certain implants. 
Now, lasers are classified based on several things, but the main, the main classification is based on their potential risk of causing injury and damage. It has nothing to do with progressing through, uh, you know, different stages in one class being the next generation of laser therapy classes. So, Theralase lasers are classified as a class 3B laser system, and class 4 lasers are inherently uh, do pose more risk for injury and damage than class 3B lasers because they do have a thermal effect. So the power, we can take a closer comparison between 3B and class 4 lasers in the next slide. We know that the power of a single diode laser is between 5 to 500 milliwatts for a class 3B laser. So this is classified as a low level, level laser device, whereas a class 4 laser their um, lower limit is 500 milliwatts. So for class four lasers, their single diode power is above 500 milliwatts, classified as a high level laser uh, device. Now the initial use for class four lasers, they were developed for surgical therapy because they do, as I mentioned, they do produce heat. So they're more uh, for ablative therapy, whereas class three B lasers are for photobiomodulation and they enhance cellular function. So again, there are hazards associated with, um, with both. The only hazard with a class 3B is direct exposure of the eye to the laser beam. Whereas with class 4, we have a significant risk of burning the skin as well as a fire hazard. Now in terms of clinical applications, as mentioned previously, class 3B lasers can be used over metal implants and pacemakers whereas class four lasers cannot due to the thermal effects. The class three, three B lasers usually don't produce any sensation. There may be some warmth or tingling that's reported by the patients. Uh, and, and the probe application technique is stationary. You just keep the probe in direct contact with the skin. Whereas with a class four laser, because of the heat generated, you have to keep the probe in constant motion. Now, the biggest thing is the clinical support or the clinical research uh, that, that is backing up these particular devices or, cl or classes of laser devices. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of research on class 3B lasers. As mentioned previously, there's over 3,000 clinical studies. There's not as much research, if any, on class 4 lasers. And what we do find is that class 4 lasers, uh, laser companies are using the research and literature based on class 3B laser devices. And just so you know also, class 4 lasers are approved by the FDA as a heating device. Now let's go into the uh, science of low-level laser therapy and talk about what, what it actually is. So it's the transformation of light energy into chemical energy by the body in order to stimulate and ac accelerate the healing process. Laser therapy can actually span between the red and infrared band of the electromagnetic spectrum. Theralase uses two, two distinct wavelengths of light. We use a 660 nanometer visible red light and a 905 nanometer invisible infrared light. Now, the first, there's two laws of photochemistry um, that are behind low-level laser therapy. And the first law of photochemistry, known as the Grotus-Draper law, states that light of the correct wavelength must penetrate to the tissue of interest in order to get a result. So in other words, the light must be absorbed by the cells. The second law of photochemistry, known as the Stark-Einstein law, states that light that is absorbed by the tissues will cause a photochemical reaction. We have photoreceptors in, uh, in, our, in the tissues and the cells of our body, and some of the well-known photoreceptors are, for example, rhodopsin, which is used in vision. We have hemoglobin in the blood and myoglobin in muscle. But the laser therapy actually works on and actually activates cytochrome C oxidase. This is the main uh, chromophore that absorbs light therapy within the mitochondria of the cell. So the mitochondria is the main site for the initial effects of light, and, it's, and the electron transport chain within the mitochondria is the location of this particular uh, chromophore. When we, talk, when we look at chromophores, chromophores are the, the part of the molecule that absorbs this light and is responsible for its color. 
So if we take a look at this graph, it's, it shows you that the therapeutic window or the therapeutic wavelength range is from 600 to 970 nanometers. So we want our laser devices to be within this range of wavelengths. If we take a look at the red curved line in the graph here, that represents oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin. We know that light at a wavelength below the 600 nanometers is going to be primarily absorbed by blood, by hemoglobin, and this is going to severely limit how deep that light can penetrate into the tissues. If we look at the blue line, that represents water, and light at a wavelength above 970 nanometers will primarily be absorbed by water, which will lead to excessive tissue heating. And then the green curve is melanin. And melanin, which is actually dependent upon skin color, it, it's going to absorb light ranging from about 80% at 600 nanometers to 20% at 970 nanometers. So the lower the wavelength between these two limits, the greater the absorption of light by melanin, which means the lesser the penetration depth. So when we talk about the effectiveness or the efficacy of a low-level laser device, the efficacy is defined by several things, one of which is the light source. So when we talk about the light source, we talk about true laser diodes versus LEDs. There are significant differences between these two uh, light sources, and an LED is, is simply not as effective as a laser diode, and there's actually uh, several clinical studies that compare them side by side, the laser diode has always come out ahead. And that's because of the principles of light known as collimation and coherence. You can see in the image there, an LED light is a non, the photons are not going to travel in the same direction at the same time. So they're not in sync and they, they don't travel forward, which means they scatter all over the place and only about 5 to 6% of that light energy is going to be penetrating the tissue. Whereas with a pure laser diode, you get 100% of that light energy traveling in a forward direction. They're in sync, they're in phase, and they're going to penetrate uh, through, that, through the skin and, and into your target tissue. Now, the next thing is the correct wavelength, which we discussed. So uh, the laser, to generate laser light of the correct wavelength is important in order to stimulate the specific light-sensitive uh, chromophores that you want to stimulate, so cytochrome C oxidase, for example. The next factor is penetration depth. So you need to have the ability to penetrate to your tissue of interest in order to have a photochemical reaction. So you can achieve this in several ways, one being the correct wavelength, so um, the, the light isn't absorbed by molecules such as hemoglobin, or, or water, and you, you don't want it to be absorbed by that, you want it to be, be absorbed by cytochrome C oxidase. It also depends on the power that's delivered at the surface, and it also depends on the mode of delivery. So SuperPulse allows us to get that light up to five inches in depth. So we need to deliver the required dose to the tissue of interest, and we'll talk about that in the next slide a little bit more. So this is known as the biphasic dose response, which is associated with the second law of, co of photochemistry. So we know that there's an optimal dose of laser light that's going to give us the maximum therapeutic effect. If we provide too little laser energy, we're not going to see much therapeutic effect, no or minimal efficacy with that. If we surpass that and we actually get this curved graph to cross that horizontal x-axis, we're using an excess amount of laser energy, which can actually lead to bioinhibition and, again, a lack of eff efficacy. So we need to be delivering the exact dose of laser light to a patient's condition in order to maximize the efficacy of our treatments. Now, Theralase uses SuperPulse 905 nanometer technology which allows us to actually deliver a high peak power at the surface of the skin without creating or generating any heat. So they're very, very quick, short bursts of light being delivered at a very high intensity that allows us to penetrate up to five inches in depth. This is for our 905 nanometer near-infrared laser diodes. 
Our 660 nanometer visible red laser diodes, they penetrate more superficially um, and they're, they're more effective for wound healing as well as treatment of superficial tissues. So let's take a closer look at the mechanisms of action and the specific pathways that are activated by Theralase lasers. So specific wavelengths are going to activate specific known cellular pathways, and that's why we use our, the specific wavelengths that we use. The 660 nanometer wavelength is going to activate the ATP pathway. So again, the light is absorbed by cytochrome C oxidase within the electron transport chain of the mitochondria to generate more ATP, which is going to help the tissues um, accelerate its heal their healing process. The second pathway is known as the nitric oxide pathway. This is activated by 905 nanometer laser diodes. And as the light is absorbed by blood vessels, it increases the production of nitric oxide, which we know is a potent vasodilator. And when we get more blood flow through an area, it'll help reduce inflammation in that area. And finally, our last pathway is known as the lipid absorption pathway, again activated by the 905 nanometer wavelength of light. And what this pathway does is it the light is going to rebalance the flow of sodium and potassium ions across the cell membrane and remove that transmission of pain across the nerve. So we have three specific pathways that are activated and they're going to together work to accelerate the healing process, reduce inflammation and eliminate pain. Secondary effects of laser therapy as a result of the activation of these pathways uh, can be seen on this slide. So we do know that laser therapy increases angiogenesis as well as neovascularization, increases the, the uh, production of collagen, uh, helps with the, the regeneration of muscles and decreases any muscle atrophy. It's very effective in treating fractures and increasing nerve regeneration. Now we're going to talk a little bit about how it can be an effective tool in clinical practice and um, the conditions that you can treat with laser therapy. There's over 80 conditions that can be successfully treated and this is just a, a glimpse into some of them. You know, it's a, it's a number of different neuromusculoskeletal conditions that you can treat with laser therapy, but in addition to that you can treat dermatological conditions such as psoriasis, eczema, you can treat dental conditions. We have dentists treating for post-surgical, um, you know, if they have their, their wisdom teeth removed, you can help control the pain and inflammation around their wisdom teeth. We've got podiatrists using laser therapy for uh, any, any type of foot, ankle, knee conditions. So there's a number of different uses for laser therapy, um, including uh, autoimmune disease. So like I mentioned earlier, rheumatoid arthritis, um, ankylosing spondylitis can definitely uh, can definitely be uh, be healed with or not healed but helped with uh, laser therapy. Additionally, we do offer an acupuncture probe, and the Theralase lasers can be applied to acupuncture points within the ear as well as certain meridian points along the body. We we use the acupuncture probe to mainly to stimulate. Um, trigger points as well as smoking. We have smoking cessation and weight loss programs. So the laser treatments are very effective at creating a relaxing feeling for the patient as well as many of the physiological systems. And in smoking cessation, this actually helps reduce cravings. It, um, it changes the, the taste of the cigarettes for the patients. Uh, in, when you're treating trigger points, it can decrease muscle sp spasms, and it also helps reduce stress reactions. So all of this, using, using laser acupuncture to stimulate certain points, can help create balance throughout the body. We also offer laser therapy products for veterinarians. So we can, um, we can treat small companion animals or equines, because we know that mammalian cells will generally react the same to laser therapy as human cells do. And you know, cats, dogs, horses, they all, they all suffer from the same musculoskeletal and wound injuries that humans do. And, and this is a very safe and effective way to help your, your animals. It's, again, non-thermal, non-invasive, without any side effects or discomfort. We've got over 16 clinically tested pre-programmed treatments 
within our laser devices. So this is just an example of some of the conditions that you'll see within our laser systems. Uh, wounds or lick granulomas, any post-surgical conditions, it's, it works very well at reducing uh, pain and inflammation, swelling, helping uh, sutures heal better post-operatively. And just to summarize some of the benefits of laser therapy, it can help decrease pain and inflammation, stimulate new tissue growth, promote angiogenesis or new blood vessels, promote nerve axon growth. Again, it's non-invasive, no side effects, and very few contraindications. When we're talking about the, uh, the benefit to your business, it can certainly add a new treatment option or a new modality to your practice that you may be able to, to use with more patients than some of the other modalities that you're currently using in your, in your practice. Definitely generates a new stream of income and it can differentiate your clinic between other clinics who don't currently offer laser therapy. Now the clinical benefit as discussed is that the laser therapy system works on a cellular level. So we're looking at a long-term healing as opposed to temporary pain relief with low level laser therapy and we accelerate the recovery times of these patients. So top reasons why laser therapy is becoming more and more pervasive in clinical settings. Well, we know that over one and a half billion people worldwide suffer from chronic pain. The pain market will only continue to grow as it's fueled by the aging population and the rising healthcare costs. Opioid overprescription is, is a second reason. Uh, opioid addictions are becoming a much greater problem and laser therapy is a superior alternative to these painkillers without any side effects. There's over 3,000 clinical studies worldwide that have proven the effectiveness of laser therapy um, and it can help postpone or in some cases eliminate the need for surgery and significantly increases recovery times, accelerates the healing process and patients um, will heal quicker and get improved clinical outcomes. Thank you very much, Dr. Angelewski. I appreciate that. We're now moving into the second module of the webinar, now focused on our clinical panel. Once again, we have with us today Cheryl Russell, Dr. David Homer, and Dr. William Stephen to be able to provide us with responses to questions that um, are common questions for individuals looking at putting laser into their clinical practice but also to be able to respond to any questions that you may have. And once again, I would encourage you, if you do have questions, to uh, enter those questions into the question box, and our team here will collate them and uh, do our best to get to those questions that are asked. So um, at this time, we have um, um, everyone online, Dr. Stephen, Cheryl Russell, and Dr. Homer. and so. Uh, what we'd like to do is, is start with, um, uh, we've categorized these questions to maybe help you out a little bit more into questions related to pre-purchase, clinical effectiveness, reimbursement, implementation, marketing, and education. So I, I'm going to start with the category pre-purchase, and, and the question I'm going to ask for each of the practitioners would be, uh, the following. So take us back to when you were considering the purchase of a laser for your practice or clinic. What were the most important factors that you considered in your decision process? Let's go to Dr. Homer at this time. Dr. Homer. Thank you. Um, when I was first looking into it, being a chiropractor, I needed depth. I uh, was treating a whole bunch of ankles and knees and carpal tunnels. I was looking for the laser to do neck, mid-back, low back, disc, uh, facet issues, piriformis, um, SI joint. So I had a, a large difficulty finding a laser that, uh, in my mind, would penetrate that deep. So once I, I did find Therolase, actually my information that I was looking for for purchasing, uh, you know, expanded. I then wanted a, a 3B laser because I appreciate the safety. Uh, but once every two weeks, I get asked a question about laser. Everybody thinks it's going to hurt, it's hot, uh, so I, I really do enjoy the fact that it's a 3B and it's very safe. I appreciate the portability of it, 
uh, of the, the Theralase product and the speed of implementation. Um, Theralase is in, in downtown Toronto and I'm in downtown Toronto and I have to say I think I picked the laser up at 1.30 and I was using it in my office at 3 o'clock. So that was phenomenal and of course I was billing at 3 o'clock as well for it. Uh, and then the cost. I found the cost to be um, uh, efficient for it. The one thing that I do like about Theralase is when I left, I needed um, information and I was able to use their pricing schedule. They helped me out figuring out uh, to charge for it. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Homer, by the way. Uh, uh, Cheryl, um, how about you from your end? Take us back when you were considering the purchase of a laser. Um, first and foremost for me um, was that the laser that I was using actually worked um, for uh, uh, there are many different manufacturers out there that I tested and tried and it was when I actually got to Theralase uh, I saw changes in my own body um, which was really important moving forward because I saw it firsthand how Theralase actually worked on my own body. Uh, that was really important to me that I can have faith and confidence in the equipment that I'm actually using. Um, safety was a very big factor for me using a uh, class 3B versus a class 4. I have therapists in my office who um, do the laser therapy and it was important for me uh, to make sure that safety wise uh, no one could ever get injured. Um, the um, ease of use of Aralase, the computer, the entering patients, the ability to um, go back and view patient history. Um, so the software of Theralase ease of use was also very important. Um, the return on investment, the RLI, uh, again, um, like uh, Dr. Stafford that just said, you know, within a couple of hours of having the equipment in his office, he started using it, and that return on my investment, same with me here, was almost immediate. So those are most of the important factors that went into my decision in uh, choosing Theralase. Dr. Stephen, uh, just same question. Take us back when you were considering the purchase of laser for your practice. Uh, what were the important factors you considered in your decision process? So I, I had been using a, a much smaller laser prior to Theralase, and uh, w one of the major factors was the fact that the Theralase was FDA approved, um, and I wanted something that was FDA approved that I could use on my patients, and I also felt more comfortable advertising with an FDA approved laser. I mean, as far as my experience with it, I've said a couple of times it is a workhorse laser. I, we've used it many hours a day on patients. I've had the one I have and now I have the 2000, but even the 1000 that I got in 2006 is still working you know, very well. I, we see a variety of things. I mean, I use it everywhere from any you know, inflammation in the abdomen to joint injuries, surgery, recovery, anything that involves inflammation essentially. I, I, mean, I was very happy with the decision of, of choosing Theralase. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to clinical effectiveness, the question uh, we wanted to ask the panelists, tell us about your clinical experience in terms of treatment effectiveness. How did the patients respond to it? Uh, Dr. Homer. Thank you. I, I find the patients respond in, in two ways. Um, one, of course, their, their body responds quite quickly to the area of injury and uh, the fresher the injury. Um, the faster the care uh, that occurs. And then the patients themselves mentally are quite impressed, especially when you have a chronic condition that I'm usually probably last on their list to come to. Uh, and within maybe about two or three weeks, something that they've been suffering with for a couple of years uh, has been greatly reduced in pain and um, increase in mobility. They are absolutely amazed. And uh, that does work quite well for uh, my marketing inside of uh, the practice as well. Terrific. Uh, Cheryl, what about yourself? I find uh, there's definitely a difference between the chronic versus the acute patients. Um, my acute patients, we see um, positive results almost instantly. Um, 
sometimes we see patients' uh, inflammation reduce before they even walk out the door. Um, as far as my chronic patients are concerned, where they've had absolutely no success um, pretty much with any other modality, are very impressed when they see after the second or third treatment, they see changes in their um, ability or range of motion or uh, their reduced pain, reduced inflammation. Uh, we find tremendous benefit in bursitis patients, which inflammatory conditions respond almost instantly. So the patients are very, very pleased and happy before they even walk out the door. Thank you, Cheryl. Moving to Dr. Stephen now. My experience with the laser, again, for obviously acute conditions, as Cheryl said, it, it you can see uh, results immediately. Uh, some people get up and their pain is almost gone. I mean, other people will, will take uh, three to five, you know, treatments, you know, chronic problems. I, I, I generally tell people it's probably going to take six to nine to see how it's, if you're getting some effect from it. Again, we, we treat a variety of things, any type of low back injury we use it on, any type of knee injury we use it on, shoulder injuries, wrist injuries, tendonitis in the elbow, foot and ankle problems. Again, I, I've used it on diverticulitis uh, with antibiotics, but just to take uh, some of the inflammation out. I mean, we've even used it sometimes on migraine headaches. We've had some success with that. It, it's a mainstay of our... Uh, treatment for our patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Stephen. Just still on the topic of clinical effectiveness, a two-part question, and I'll start with Dr. Homer on this. How well do chronic patients respond to low-level laser therapy treatment? And then what would you say are the top three conditions that respond the best? I can really just, for my chronic patients, I can share two or three methods in, in which I, I've used it. Um, one was on a 65-year-old patient with ankylosing spondylitis, and I had just had the laser for about three or four months and decided just to use it on him. I wasn't quite sure if it was going to work because I hadn't um, had used it in that manner before. But lo and behold, I put it on him. The next day, he woke up saying he felt like a 25-year-old. He was able to get out of bed faster. Uh, some of the pain was still there, but definitely felt less tight, looser better mobility, and actually, oddly enough, just this week, my last treatment, or the last treatment with her was this morning, and I have a patient, another one with uh, erosive ankylosing spondylitis on uh, both SI joints, and I am the last person that she sort of chose. There were two other chiropractors that she had seen, another physio, massage therapist, personal trainers, and then she landed up in my office, and we have taken her from a eight down to a four uh, in the span of seven visits. And that's uh, with her suffering with this for well over uh, three years. And again, many other treatments didn't work for her. Another one that I found was incredibly interesting and, and uh, really completely sold me into the fact that laser works wonderfully well is whenever I have one of those patients inside of my practice that you know, you get them 90% better, 95% better, but for some reason, a flare-up comes up. And these flare-ups happen about every two or three months, and you can't correlate them to anything. I've done a re-exam on them. Maybe I've even sent them for x-rays. I've tried exercise. I've tried adjusting, not adjusting, um, many different things. So I decided to put laser on these people. Uh, and generally, they were low back issues that I was having, um, fully stabilizing and resolving. And again, Five, six visits down the road, lo and behold, looser, tighter, uh, sorry, um, the body was, had better mobility, and when I mean tighter, the adjustment lasted longer. The adjustments now, you know, flare-ups were happening once or twice a year rather than literally once every month or every two months because that was just getting really frustrating, and I, I wasn't quite sure what to, what to do with them. I was about to refer them out to someone else. I, I used everything, but when I put the laser on them, that seemed to clear up some deep level irritation, inflammation that I couldn't see, I couldn't palpate, uh, wasn't warm to the touch, there was no swelling on the surface, but something deep at the facet or disc level, again, going towards the depth of their lays, um, remarkable improvement for that chronic patient. 
Thank you, Dr. Homer. I know, Cheryl, you talked already about uh, how patient or chronic patients respond, but perhaps you can focus on the, the other question, which is what would you say are the top three conditions that respond the best in your very busy practice? Sure. Um, just to touch on the, the chronic conditions, uh, just again for a second, um, it really depends on the length of time that the patient's been suffering with the chronic condition as well. Um, clearly, a patient that will walks in that's had a condition for two years versus a patient that walks in that has the condition for 12, there's going to be a difference most of the time. The conditions that we see that respond very quickly are inflammatory conditions. Um, reduction of inflammation, reduction of pain happens very, very quickly. TMJ, for me, for, for whatever reason, every patient that's walked in the door with TMJ responds within that first treatment. I'd say we go six to eight treatments with TMJ patients, and they're feeling just about 90 to 90, 95% improvement. Matter of fact, the other day I was treated a patient for TMJ. He walked in, it was I think his seventh or eighth treatment, and he was chewing gum. I said, I think you're good. I think it, may, it might be time to graduate you. So uh, TMJ, I find, is, is really, Sterilase has been really, really beneficial. Arthritic knees, meniscus tears, knees are, are one of the easiest parts of the, the body that we treat. I find knees respond very quickly as well. Rotator cuffs, they can be a little trickier, but um, the reduction in inflammation for those patients, they see pain reduction right away, and then it takes a little longer for them to get uh, range of motion and feel less pain during range of motion. But for the most part, those are the three conditions that I have success, success with very quickly. The other is, is bursitis. You know, we do a, a lot of hip bursitis, and we see that response very quickly as well. Thank you, Cheryl. Dr. Stephen, if I could ask you uh, on the chronic patient's response, as well as what you feel in your uh, medical practice the top three conditions are that respond the best? First, the, the top three conditions that respond the best, at least... I, I believe uh, ankle sprains respond extremely well, tendonitis of the elbow, and generally like knee sprains and knee problems. Those three seem to respond the, the best. As far as chronic problems, uh, I, I, when I think of chronic problems, I think of like chronic low back pain. Again, I, those patients are a little more difficult to, to treat, especially when they're on chronic pain meds. And a lot of times the treatment will help but then it will it will wear off but in, in that case if it does help people i tell them that they should you know use the laser just like they would a medication where they have to come once a week or once every two weeks and and have the laser done to help uh, control the the chronic uh, inflammation that's in their back or the chronic injury thank you dr Stephen. appreciate your your comments on that let's uh let's move from clinical effectiveness now to reimbursement and and because we have um, a, a very large global uh, representation on, on the webinar today, this, this may be a challenge, but uh, let, let's start with this question here. And I can ask the, the panelists, please discuss how you set your clinic up from a billing standpoint. In other words, how did you set up the business aspect of your laser treatments? Cheryl, let's start with you. As far as the billing aspect of, of the way I bill my laser treatments, I, have, I don't put together packets at all for my patients. We, we just basically bill out per treatment. We have patients pay at the end of the week because most of the time patients are coming in two to three times per week. As far as insurance reimbursement here in the United States, cold laser therapy at this point or photobiomodulation is, is not covered. I have seen some coding or infrared heating things of that nature that can be billed out. In my office, we do not bill insurance. I keep the pricing of my laser treatments down. I will be happy to share with you for the first body part or first condition that we treat, we charge $60 for that treatment. Most of the treatments range time frame is anywhere from two minutes to the most being about 15 minutes depending upon how many areas, uh, how many positions that we're treating. Um, that would be for the first condition. 
most of the time when patients come in, we're treating them for more than just one condition. So if I'm treating two conditions at one time, we charge $40 for the second condition and $30 for the third condition. So I had a new patient come in this morning. We're treating her uh, C-spine as well as a hip bursitis. So she's paying $60 for her C-spine basically and $40 for the hip bursitis. I'm seeing her three days a week, so she's paying $100 per, um, per visit that she pays at the end of the week. Like I said, we don't do any insurance billing here, so I try to keep costs low and finding that if patients see results within the first two to three weeks, then they're definitely willing to be in for two to three hundred dollars per week. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, Dr. Stephen, as a medical doctor uh, and a very, very busy practice since I, I've been there, how do you uh, proceed with uh, on a business side of things with laser treatments? Most of the, most of the uh, insurance companies do not do not pay for it, so the patients do pay. You know, uh, it's a it's a cash payment. Uh, we are able to bill um, no fault sometimes, and sometimes compensation for uh, under the infrared heat code. But 90% of it is is a is a cash pay, and 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 again, we we keep it very reasonable, so patients don't really mind uh, paying for it. It's been it's been uh, it's been fine, you know. And I have a very middle class uh, blue collar, you know, population. So I think your last point's a very very important one. Demographics comes into play, and and I don't think given the diversity we uh, of of areas where everyone's coming from, you really have to look at it from a business standpoint and what you you know what area what your community like and. We certainly have customers in very affluent areas that, that charge in excess of $100 per treatment, and uh, the reverse is true as well. So I think it's good to get feedback on what your average pricing schedules would be, but at the end of the day, you know your business really well. You know what type of return you want to have. You know the demographics that you work within. Um, ultimately, you, you, um, you would have to work through that yourself, but I think it's important to get feedback from each of these individuals to, to certainly get an idea of how they structure it. Uh, Dr. Homer, how about yourself? Um, I've used it uh, many different ways from being in Canada. I use $45 for a single spot, and that's somewhere around three to five different spots uh, on the body. After that, I can get into $55, which uh, might be a, a longer time period. Perhaps it's a, a larger patient, or we need to get uh, much, much deeper. And then I will do $75, and that's when, you know, we have, uh, you know, quite a large problem. Perhaps it's also some hip bursitis and piriformis and SI and low back and, and all of those, and that would be about $75. But rarely do I, I, I charge the $75 or have the need to, to do that much. But as a business practice, for me, I've done a complimentary on patients. I just had somebody in yesterday who thought that he broke his toes. He's been a longtime patient of mine. Um, probably 10, 12 years he's been a patient of mine, uh, and he thought he broke his toes. So I'm thinking maybe the fifth one. He said, no, the three middle ones. So I checked them out and adjusted them, and then I just put laser top and bottom, three minutes. Uh, he came in the next day because we were dealing with an SI joint issue, and he said it's 90% gone. And that I did complimentary on him. He's been with me for, for 12 years. So I've also done it as an intro. I think earlier I was discussing the fact that uh, I have sometimes patients where they get 95% better and then they have a flare up all the way down to, you know, 50% better. And I had somebody on Monday that we were doing absolutely fantastic, saw him Friday, no problems, everything is great. And then Monday he wakes up and comes in and he is horrible. He's worse, he's stiff, couldn't get out of bed, 35 years old and, and not very happy. I said, let me try the laser on him. So we tried the laser on him, three spots on the right, three spots on the left for low back. And I told him, if you wake up the next morning feeling fantastic, we need to do two more and then follow a course of it. He comes in on Tuesday, said, I've never gotten so better, so fast. Uh, he said, I woke up, I was loose, it was easy, I wasn't stiff, I didn't have to walk down the stairs holding onto the rail. And, you know, we continue with the Tuesday treatment, a Wednesday treatment. I'm going to give him a day off and we'll do a treatment tomorrow on Friday for him. So I use it multiple different ways inside of my practice. Thanks, Dr. Homer. 
again, another question on reimbursement, and I'll direct this to Cheryl. Cheryl, does the patient receive any other treatment or modalities uh, during the visit or just laser? And uh, how many laser treatments do you do a day? I use, I will use medical massage with, with some of my patients. It depends on what the condition is that the patient's coming in with. Um, if the patient's coming in with a bone-on-bone a -bone arthritis, clearly there's not much that I'm going to be able to do hands-on wise. And in that case, um, you know, the patient is only being treated with laser. Uh, if a patient comes in with uh, lower back issues, I will definitely do some hands-on work, release some of the musculature in the area before we put them into laser therapy. Uh, so in my office, we, we definitely use the um, both modalities. How many laser treatments do you do a day? Uh, a day. Here we do anywhere between 12 and 20 a day, depending upon the day. Uh, we're here five days a week, Monday through Friday. For the most part, we're seeing anywhere between 50 and 70 patients per week at this point. And, and if you know Cheryl, she's running uh, at least four rooms of lasers all at once. She's uh, very uh, efficient in, in how she treats. So. Um, yeah, I also I also have um, two laser therapists here in the office who have been certified, and they do a lot of the laser therapy, you know, outside of my treatment room. And then if I'm in my treatment room doing some hands-on work, some soft tissue work, uh, I have also two probes in my treatment room as well. So in my practice, we're running eight probes. I have two probes per room, and you know, in any room we can treat the patients in any of the treatment rooms we have here. Thank you, Cheryl. Dr. Homer, how about the same question? Uh, in this case, does the patient receive any other treatment or modalities during the visit or just laser? We can do just laser sometimes, but the majority of my practice is adjustments with uh, laser as well. But I find that laser, because you don't have to use any gels or, or anything, works well with kinesio taping, um, especially for a rotator cuff if you want to use the laser on some of the bursitis. Um, I can then move into uh, active release technique to reduce some of the tension uh, and irritation or some of the fascial work that you can do with ART or any of the fascial kind of tools that are out there. And then adjust, tape, different type of modalities. And I find laser works very well because it's actually very quick, very quick to do as a practitioner and very quick to see results uh, for the patient. Thank you very much for responding to, to those, uh, those questions on reimbursement. In terms of implementation, let's focus on, you know, what are what are some of the, the initial challenges you faced when you implemented the laser technology that, that you selected? Uh, Dr. Steven, what about yourself? As far as basically one of the issues was to whether or not to uh, actually hire somebody to work the laser, which we, we actually do now, uh, trying to have the nurses do it in between patients, it got a little difficult. But as far as implementing, I don't know exactly. It's very easy to use, and uh, it, it did not take long to get used to the settings and what to use for different problems. Like I said, it's helpful to have a laser therapist that's able to spend time with the patient and sit there and instead of trying to do it between people, at least in our practice. Thank you for that, Dr. Steven. Uh, Dr. Homer, what about you? What were the challenges you faced with? Not many. Uh, like I said, I uh, was interested in the Theralase. They um, allowed me to rent a loaner. So I showed up here. My lunch is between 1.30 and 3. I showed up here. They watched the patient being treated, was given the information on how to use it, practiced once or twice with uh, one of the people here at Theralase. And at 3 o'clock, it was on a patient being billed and, and being used. Uh, also, you know, within Canada, it is not a regulated act for laser. So as long as the practitioner is on the premise, you can have somebody else move the laser around. So I will actually take a yellow highlighter and put dots where I want the laser to be moved. And if I'm too busy or I'm with somebody else, my office manager will just pop in there and move it. It takes, you know, just a few seconds to do. And again, you can bill at the, uh, the same time. With the loaner, since again, I borrowed everything pretty much from 
fairly so I used their pricing and they also gave me the consent form we had my rental paid off in two weeks I actually will tell them that I uh, I stretched my loan up to two months because I was making quite a bit of money off it so um, before purchasing it um, and they were again quite kind with that but I saw immediate revenue from it so the re return on investment is, is is very sound very sound like two weeks I paid off it's impressive how about yourself uh, Cheryl the same question for me it, it was really like the fear of the unknown you know I started treating with quality of therapy many years ago and years ago in the United States there no one was treating with cold laser here in the United States so for me it was really the fear of the unknown unknown for myself treating patients and watching patients respond how they respond you know not sure am I going to get repeatable sustainable results you know so so I had a, a pretty healthy fear going into it myself as to how patients were going to respond also in explaining to patients you know how am I going to really explain to patients that I'm going to be charging them essentially anywhere from sixty dollars to a hundred and thirty dollars three times a week how are the patients going to accept that also knowing that they might not see results right away so I, I had a, a little bit of difficulty there but I think a lot of that was more my own fears as a practitioner and then actually moving forward getting to a point where I was doing so many laser treatments that it became it, it wasn't beneficial for me to continue to treat patients with laser and I had to start hiring I was quite concerned about hiring a laser therapist and the salary that was going to be going out now am I going to be able to cover that salary as well so there, there were definitely some challenges we definitely overcame them and are very successful at this point but it was for me more of, of like the fear of the unknown was my biggest issue Cheryl, an add-on question to that, and it really ties into uh, implementation and, and you know, also to the question of benefit to your practice. What, what, what is your typical uh, or expected time duration on a low-level laser therapy session? Is it, you know, fairly lengthy? You know, are we looking at 30, 45 minutes, an hour, or uh, what, what can you say about that? Absolutely not. The greatest length would be be anywhere between 12 and 15 minutes and that would really be for a lower back uh, where you're treating six uh, different positions with the laser and, and each position is about two two and a half minutes so you're looking at anywhere between a 15 minute period of time but if we're treating someone let's say for a, a lateral epicondylitis and we I'm using two positions sometimes three but you know, the tissue depth we're trying to get to is, is certainly not as deep as, as a hip would be or a lower back. So we're looking at two to four minutes of treatment. So we're turning patients in and out within 10 minutes, you know, of walking in the office, getting into the treatment room, pulling them up on the computer, treating those two locations, and the patient walking out. It's really, really anywhere from two to 15 minutes. And with that type of uh, situation, is it just once a week or twice a week, three times? And is it you know, every day or is it every other day? How do you structure that? Okay, I have patients come in. The first week I treat the patients is I treat them three days in a row. I feel it's important to get enough energy into the tissue as quick as possible in the first week. The second week I have the patient come in three times, but not in a row. So the patient will come in whenever it's really convenient for them. They can do in a row if they need to, but I'd prefer to treat them with a day in between. And that would be the second and the third week. Typically by nine treatments, we certainly have seen the patient's benefit. The patient has seen the benefit, and we can start weaning them down a little bit. I go to twice a week at that point. I tell my patients that at the point with which they feel they're about 60% improved, we drop them to once a week. And at once a week, we take them from 60% to about 90, 95%. And at that point, the patient is discharged. So every patient's different and the conditions are different. But typically, it is a case in a row the first week, three times the second and third week, 
and we drop them to, to twice a week until we are at about 60%. Then we go to once a week until the patient graduates. Thank you, Cheryl. Um, Dr. Angelewski, what about um, what you see? Because you run a very busy clinic here in Toronto. Uh, what are you seeing you know, for a time duration? Is it pretty much consistent to that? How do you schedule patients for treatment? Yeah, I mean, Cheryl is pretty, uh, pretty accurate in, in, um, in her explanation. Treatment times can range anywhere from three to five minutes to, as Cheryl said, maximum about 15 minutes, depending on the treatment area that, that you're trying to treat. So with actually with the TLC 2000, it's significantly cut down our treatment times because we have the ability of using up to four probes on a patient at once. So when, uh, when we treat the lower back, for example, um, we can use we can use two probes at once and you know a typical treatment point for a lower back would be about about three minutes per point so if we're you know we're using two probes at once we're looking at a six minute treatment for the lower back if we have four probes which we use in our clinic so for for four probes on a lower back you're looking at three minutes because you're treating all four points at once so the ability to actually use multiple probes significantly reduces our treatment times in the clinic. And, you know, we can schedule patients um, fairly, fairly quickly in, in about 10 minute, 10 to 15 minute time slots. So that's a, a, an accurate um, explanation as to the expected time duration of a laser session. In terms of frequency of lasers, if I may add on to that, uh, frequency of laser treatments, when that really depends on the chronicity of the condition so you're looking at acute subacute and chronic if the patient comes in with an injury that's that's acute so we're looking at anywhere from a couple of weeks to about a month on average you'll require about five treatment sessions for an acute injury we're talking subacute so a few months up to six months maybe and the times can vary depending on the practitioner that you talk to. So it's just a, an approximation. Uh, for subacute conditions, you're looking at an average of about 10 treatment sessions with laser therapy. And then chronic is going to take a little bit longer as with every type, any type of treatment that you do. Chronic patients typically take a little bit longer to respond. And we're looking at an average of 20 treatment sessions for laser therapy in that case. Dr. Stephen, what about yourself on the implementation side? What, in your medical practice, what were your, your challenges and how long before you saw benefit? We started using the laser immediately, and as far as revenue, we, I mean, I bought the laser and, and not, not charging very much, uh, like we charged about, when we started, about $15 a treatment, again, in 2006. Within, like, 10 months, we had paid for the, for the laser which I was happy with. And then uh, as far as uh, scheduling, I don't know. I mean, I think we try to give about a 20-minute space. We're, we're not rushing people. But as they said, you know, the treatments, we do have the TLC 2000. So my general rule was not to go beyond about 15 minutes total. So with the 2000, it's probably uh, more like a five to eight-minute treatment time, you know. Thank you, Dr. Stephen. Appreciate it. There's a couple of additional questions that I'm, I'm picking up here that I, I think we can address before we move on to the next category of marketing. There was a question related to treatment of, instead of humans, treatment of animals, and what uh, special challenges does that create? Most animals I'm familiar with have fur, whether it's equine or feline or canine, and it's like clothing. To be able to, to use um, a, a laser probe over fur is going to lose a lot of the, the benefit of the photon energy uh, unless you can separate the fur. Now, you know, certainly shaving is one approach, but not every owner wants to have their pet shaved for uh, therapeutic laser therapy. So if you're looking at technology to support that, you know, if it's a class 3B, you want to make sure that the, there is a fur separator attachment that allows you to get close to the skin. Uh, in order to deliver the optimal amount of energy uh, to to that particular animal. You've got to be very, very careful with the class four, even though it, uh, we, we know it's used there. But again, you've got to keep that fur cool uh, or risk burning. So I'd say in, certainly in a 3B, there are fur separators out there. 
that allows you to get close to, to that area. Uh, Dr. Anders Lepsky, about yourself. Yeah, I just want to add to that, Dave, is uh, we do have specific protocols for animals that do take into consideration their fur color as well as the size of the animal. So we need to be able to, um, to customize our protocols based on these physical characteristics so, so that the, the fur doesn't absorb uh, the majority of the light. So the fur separator is definitely one way to spread the hair so that you're in as much direct skin contact as possible. And then we do have specific protocols, um, whether they have light um, colored fur or darker colored fur, um, and whether they're a small, medium, or large size, sized animal. Uh, a second part of that question, moving away from animal treatment, would be skin coloring. I think in an earlier slide, you, you did indicate that you know, skin color could mm -hmm. impact the treatment approach. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So skin, with, um, we, we do have to adjust the power and time settings according to the patient's uh, skin color. As we know, individuals with darker skin have more melanin, and melanin does tend to absorb light more superficially, and you risk the chance of generating heat and creating a thermal effect on the patient. So uh, the TLC 2000, it, it does, you do enter all of the patient's characteristics into the system, and it does take skin color as well as their height, weight, hip circumference, waist circumference into account, and um, and customizes protocols accordingly. But when you're using uh, other devices or a TLC 1000, you need, really need to consider the patient's skin color and adjust those settings yourself. So when, uh, when, you, um, when you're treating an individual with darker skin, the guideline is to cut the power in half and double the time in order to deliver the same amount of energy that you would to someone with lighter skin. Thank you for that uh, the feedback. Now let's move to now the topic of marketing. In my experience, is is a uh, always a challenge for for clinics to uh, figure out not only how to retain their patient base, but how to draw draw in new patients from a business standpoint. So let's turn to Dr. Homer on this. How do you market your laser therapy in your clinic? How do you, how do you reach out to the community to make patients aware of this, and how how are patients and their knowledge of laser therapy. Again, going back to, to Theralase and, and their support of you, there's some fantastic brochures that they have, handouts that they have, and of course posters that you can use uh, for signage, you know, exterior. Uh, I think one of them was uh, a blue one that you saw probably earlier on the, uh, the slideshow, and that is phenomenal. People, you know, come in and ask, you know, what is that? Uh, they've sort of heard of laser, but they don't know what it is, and, and it's a great chance for um, my office staff to explain it to them. And again, the brochure is right up at front and the brochure is uh, pretty much everything that this slide had, all these slides had discussed. So we're really finding that that is helping. Also, if, you know, inside of my um, bio, we discussed the fact that uh, I do a lot of education. I mean, I have my Netter book still from, you know, 1997 or four, or whenever it was that I was using it and it's still tapped for the SI points and the low back and the suboccipital muscles and, and the sciatic and piriformis. I take that out and I show them. I mean, my patients un understand the verbiage. I'm not afraid of using that. And I also talk about all of the methods with which the Theralase uh, works, you know, the, the anti-inflammatory. It works on the mitochondria. Do you remember back the electron transport chain? Do you remember uh, mitosis back when you were probably dissecting the frog back in grade, you know, 10 or 11? And surprisingly, they, they do. So a lot of patient education helps. And if they get better, that is the best method of marketing that there is. And again, our patients get better so quickly uh, with this that that's really my major marketing portion is word of mouth, which of course, as a return on investment is great because I'm not really spending anything. Thank you, Dr. Homer. Uh, Dr. Stephen, what about yourself? How do you go about marketing within your uh, medical practice? You know, we, we had a busy, a busy practice and people coming in, so it's really just uh, suggesting the laser to the patients as I see them for their various problems. And as time went on, different people that used the laser did refer some patients that weren't our patients just for the laser treatment. 
because they had had good results with it. Uh, one soccer coach in particular had good results, and, and he referred a bunch of his uh, players when they got hurt to us. But we, we didn't do any, uh, we, we haven't really done any outside marketing for the laser. But I think having the brochures is very nice to give the patients. They have them in our waiting room. We, we, again, we didn't really do any outside marketing, so. Thank you, Dr. Stevens. Cheryl, what about yourself? How do you go about marketing? You know, here in the United States, because I started many years ago, it was very difficult. Uh, there was no information about photobiomodulation and co-laser therapy at all. So I really found that I had to market quite a bit. One of the things that I did initially was to put together a packet. In my packet, I had like a referral pad printed that I would send within my packet. And basically, it's, it's very similar to like a physical therapy where a physician would check off different conditions and, and what they wanted you to actually work on and then hand it to the patient. That has all my information on it. Patient calls just from that. It's almost like a prescription, but I call it a referral pad. Also, in my packet, I sent along physiological effects, a paper that I, I had written on physiological effects of co laser therapy, along with my business cards as well. And we started targeting internists, orthopedists, chiropractors, and physical therapists here in my general area within a 10-mile radius. There are quite a bit of packets that went out, I have to say. As far as in my office itself, we use the posters, we use the pamphlets, we have, have different things on the, on the wall that we put as far as like a, we give a referral incentive to patients. Uh, if you refer a patient and that patient is part of our program, then you know, we give a, an incentive to the person who actually referred. Social media. I use social media a lot. You know, we're, we're constantly sending out. I actually have one of the therapists here in the office who is in charge of social media, and she sends out little cute blurbs daily of, oh, look what's happening here at, at Cold Laser Relief today, along with pictures. Pictures definitely help tremendously as well. You know, I, I try to tell patients that, I can show you in a picture your superficial wounds and how they healed. I have pictures of, of burns. I have some pictures of eczema, you know, superficial tissue wounds, et cetera, that I show the patients, you know, where the patient started and where the patient ended. Then I try to explain to the patient as well that, you know, we can show you the superficial wounds and how they've healed. But internally, the same thing is happening inside your body. So pictures have helped me tremendously as well. I also do speaking. I do speaking engagements. I go to um, the senior centers. Uh, I go to temples, churches, things of that nature, and, and just try to get the word out. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate that. We are now into the, uh, the very last few minutes of the webinar. I do want to highlight the availability of resources for this and the resources that you can access as being part of this webinar would be an article it comes from Dr. Tucker out of uh, California that's a very interesting one a second one from Dr. James Gregg on uh, being a go-to office with uh, advanced low-level laser therapy certainly on uh, from a demonstration standpoint if you are interested in looking further at their laser technologies uh, we have the uh, practice consultants uh, in North America that would be able to do either an online or directing office visit. And we have uh, free two-week product trials as well. If you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to us with regard to that. As we close off here, I do want to thank the panelists, Cheryl Russell, Dr. Homer, Dr. Stephen, and our main presenter, Dr. Angeleski, for their support uh, today. And especially, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day to join us on this webinar. Uh, I thank you very much and uh, wish you a very safe and happy day. Take care.